demos and uh, really look forward to it. Love that. Yes, and we love partnering with you. So thank you for the introductions. A recorded uh, version of this webinar will be available by request, and you can also find it on VIA's YouTube channel uh, post webinar. Uh, so uh, thank you so much again for uh, answering some of those post questions. If you can still see them, please do feel free to uh, answer them. Uh, and then as the host, I will interrupt our presenters today uh, to answer any questions that you may put on the chat uh, when appropriate, or we have uh, budgeted about 10 minutes or so at the end of this presentation for Q&A. So definitely feel free to put uh, those questions in the chat as we go along. You are uh, currently muted and uh, webcam is disabled, but if you'd like to ask your question live, uh, just feel free to put that in the chat and I can unmute you. Uh, so first I'd like to introduce uh, a little bit about VIA. So uh, VIA is a new kind of uh, support partner. We focus on simplifying technology through right size cloud network and security options. We offer uh, technology as a service so you can focus on your business goals while we take care of all your IT solutions. Uh, we, we believe that we are a smarter investment uh, and we are technology powered by relationship. We really love partnering with our customers, really getting to know them, and then the technology uh, runs smoother. We wanna make it simple for you. We also protect your reputation. Uh, a lot of times uh, we need to make sure that it's stability and reliable and consistency through all uh, your tools and needs. So uh, we believe that we also protect your reputation. Uh, Steve, can you uh, jump in and, and share a little bit about Barracuda? I'd be happy to. So uh, Barracuda Scout uh, Managed XD XDR uh, is a nationally recognized cybersecurity uh, provider for small and medium-sized businesses. On the right-hand side of the screen, there are some uh, industry trade journals that have actually recognized Barracuda. And not only the products that we provide and the solutions we offer, but also the people who work at our company. So we're very proud of that as well. Uh, one of the ways we protect um, your clients is to provide them with a U.S.-based security operations center that runs 24-7, 365. So someone at uh, Barracuda always has eyes on glass watching the activity across all of uh, VIA's uh, clients. Uh, we also provide a unique solution to our MSP partners. Uh, we provide one dashboard, one pane of glass, so that any time during the day, uh, VIA can log in, see the activity across their entire customer network that's running on our platform. We also provide one number to call so that if there are any questions or any information they require regarding some activity they're seeing on one of their clients' networks, they can simply pick up a phone and call directly into our security operation center and get the answers they're looking for. They could also call our Security Operations Center for just advice on cybersecurity best practices. It's always on and we're always there. Uh, we also offer one turnkey solution. So regardless of what your clients might require based on the size of their organization or compliance regulations, we have a comprehensive suite of products that include log security monitoring, network security monitoring, O365 security monitoring, email protection and endpoint protection. So that's a little bit about us, uh, Rhea. Thank you, Stephen. And you are cutting in and out a little bit. If you want to mute mm -hmm. um, and come back, uh, that might help resolve that. Um, thank you so much and congrats on all those uh, top awards. And so uh, today we're talking about cybersecurity. Keeping up with and applying the latest threat intelligence is critical to evolve your business and combat those new attacker techniques. So uh, today, Ian, Stephen, and John will be covering three ways to establish a cybersecurity framework. So if you're taking notes, uh, that is through people, processes, and technologies. Uh, Stephen, you mind uh, chatting a little bit about those three steps? Sure, so, so it's important for uh the attendees on today's webinar to realize, and what we're gonna be talking about is um, cyber, sec cyber security is not a technology problem. If there was one technology a company could buy and then uh, not have to worry about being a, or falling victim to a cyber security attack, uh, they would go out, buy that technology, and I'd be out of business. 
So, so really what we're going to present today is a holistic approach to cybersecurity, one that does talk about technology, but equally as important about the processes that you use and how to educate your people around, you know, cybersecurity awareness. So we're looking forward to that conversation today. Thank you. And before we even start defending, we need to know what we're defending against, right? So to, to start us off on our first question, uh, it is for you, Steve. I'd like to mm -hmm. ask about the cyber landscape as it relates. Can you tell us a little bit about how, how you've seen uh, at Barracuda since you started? Mm -hmm. So as I said during the introduction, I've been here for six years. And uh, as you would imagine, I've seen a lot of things change across the cybersecurity landscape, but I've also seen some things uh, stay the same. Uh, in terms of what I've seen change, there's a there's been a tremendous uptick in the way hackers leverage IoT devices to gain access to a customer's network. I mean, we've seen uh, printers become a threat vector uh, for a cybersecurity attack. Uh, we've seen uh, HVA systems become a threat vector for a cybersecurity attack. We even see, unfortunately, patient treatment devices represent a way a hacker can get onto your network and, and do serious damage. But probably the most creative way I've seen so far is uh, a hacker actually used a thermometer in a fish tank that was connected to uh, the internet as a way to access someone's network. So they're getting very creative. The other area that I see a tremendous uptick in is social media for two reasons. One, hackers use social media to do reconnaissance. So unfortunately, some CEOs of organizations uh, post that they're on vacation. And that tells a hacker that there's a pr pretty good chance that uh, if the CEO is on vacation, he or she may be out of pocket. And they use that to their advantage to ask their administrative assistant for $1,000 worth of uh, Amazon gift cards to be sent, or they'll use uh, information they see on social media uh, to gain access to a, a customer's network legitimately. So an example there is uh, a lot of people in companies use the same passwords that they use for social media for their businesses. And that's a problem because I could go out tomorrow and buy 250,000 uh, passwords on the dark web and I'll just start trying them against different companies and hopefully some of them will work. So they use social media for reconnaissance um, quite effectively. And the last thing that we've seen across the cyber uh, landscape is who attackers or hackers are now going after. You know, when I first started, they used to go after large corporations, Fortune 1000 companies. Now there's been a paradigm shift now they're going off after small and medium-sized businesses because they know they're not as well protected as those Fortune 5000 organizations. In fact, if you look at the Verizon breach report for uh, 2020, it'll tell you that 60% uh, of the hacks that take place are targeted at small and medium-sized businesses. So, you know, that, that's kind of uh, some of the trends we're seeing across the cyber landscape. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. I'd like to now ask Ian some questions. Ian, what is a recent security incident you have seen? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just like Steven said, um, small and medium businesses are, um, can no longer assume they won't be targeted. Um, they definitely are um, greater than before. Um, we recently had a uh, organization-wide phishing campaign um, that resulted in many compromised accounts. Uh, the emails contained malicious attachments, deceptive links, and so on. Um, and once those users fell for those phishing emails, we started seeing successful login attempts from all over the world, um, which were clearly unauthorized. Um, any one of those attempts could have caused significant financial or reputation damage to the organization. But fortunately, uh, before any major damage was, was done, we were able to secure those emails uh, through multi-factor authentication and conditional access policies, which uh, effectively stopped the success of those campaigns. Um, but another thing to note is, I mean, those attackers are going to naturally gravitate towards what's effective. And right now, phishing campaigns and for the foreseeable future are effective. Um, so you can't ignore that threat. Yeah, great. 
Ian, I know you've worked extremely hard over the past few months to take companies remote. Um, you've been working with companies to identify and mitigate threats uh, due to remote work. What type of new risks may be associated with that? Yeah, um, so new risks. Um, so we're seeing just a proliferation of uh, remote um, remote work is becoming adopted naturally. Um, cloud dev uh, cloud services are moving to the apps, uh, to cloud apps. Um, and for because of those users are naturally now outside of that, uh, the central security of the, the corporate walls, uh, so to speak, um, there's a heavier strain on those three assets, which are email, personal devices, and cloud apps. And so attackers are going for that. They know that the, the user are, are the weakest links and so they're they're going to increase attacks towards those three assets specifically right now. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, John, at uh, VIA, we frequently talk to our clients about getting protected from business email compromises. Could you show us how attackers go about compromising an account and what they might do uh, when they get in? Yeah, absolutely right. Um, so I'm going to be switching between two machines uh, in this demo. Uh, for one machine, I'm going to be playing the role of the attacker or hacker, um, and then I'll transition over to the victim machine and obviously play that role as well. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Uh, Y'all should be able to see that now. Uh, on the left side, we have a tool called ZFisher, and that's what's going to help me craft brand impersonation emails. Um, and this is what sort of makes the demo so scary is the fact that you really don't need a lot of knowledge, right? These are not typically masterminds behind these type of attacks. Um, it's just getting your hands on the right tools. Um, and then on the right side there, I already pre-crafted an email. Uh, I'm making this look like it's coming from Microsoft. Uh, there's apparently been a security incident with your account. Um, and uh, I'm requesting that you go ahead and sign in with the link below to remediate those. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, select option four on Z Fisher. And you can see that number corresponds to Microsoft. And this is going to generate a link that looks like a Microsoft sign in page. You can see there's a whole bunch of other options there as well Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, but we'll go ahead and copy that and paste that into the pre-crafted email here uh, with a uh, hyperlink. And we'll go ahead and hit send. And now we'll transition over to that victim machine, right? We should be receiving that email. And uh, we have that. And we can see there's an issue with the account, uh, security incident. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, sign in. And I'll go ahead and put in my email address, right? This looks like a pretty legitimate si uh, Microsoft sign-in page um, to the everyday user. I'll go ahead, put in the password and click sign in and you'll see it's starting to spin up at the top there. Um, and if we jump over to uh, the attacker machine, you can see uh, this was successful. So I do have the username and password that was just typed in. And now this is where I could start causing some harm. So I'm going to go to the actual Microsoft login page, put in the username, put in the password, and typically the first thing that we see when someone gains access to these credentials and gets into the account is set up an email forwarding rule. Um, and this is what's going to send all the email over to my attacker inbox. So we'll head over to settings, all outlook settings, and we're going to set up a rule. And I'm going to name this rule something very inconspicuous like admin. And we'll bump that out a little bit here. And uh, we'll add a condition. So I'm looking for a specific uh, keyword. For this, I'm focusing on wire transfers. So the subject is going to include uh, wire transfer. And my final action will be to forward that to, and I'm going to put my attacker email address, right? So any email from this account that I've just compromised that contains the subject of wire transfer is uh, going to head over to my inbox. And I can even have it be removed from this inbox. But for this demo purpose, we'll, uh, we'll let it go through so we can see the entire thing play out. And now I'll head back over to the victim 
machine here, and I am expecting a legitimate wire transfer. So I've been waiting for that. And if we just refresh here, there we go. So it came through. And OK, so I have a file here, PDF. I have some wire transfer instructions. But if we head over to the victim, uh, I'm sorry, the attacker machine, um, because of that email forwarding rule that I set up, I have that exact same email uh, in my inbox as well. So you can see where uh, <laughs> the damage can start to happen, right? You could sit back for you know, uh, days, weeks, months, years, and uh, just watch this email go by, intercept these emails, and um, really cause a lot of damage. Wow. Uh, without any formal training, I definitely would have fell for something like that. That made it look very easy. <laughs> Uh, wow. So John and Steve, uh, this shows us how easy it is for attackers to cause serious problems uh, for any company. How could small and medium sized businesses align to NIST to improve their cybersecurity posture? Sure. So um, that's the whole idea behind uh, NIST. Uh, it gives you a framework, hence the name uh, NIST cybersecurity framework. It gives you a framework a small or medium sized business can use to better protect themselves and the information that they have. So first of all, what is NIST? NIST is National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's a nationally recognized protocol. And uh, again, most uh, compliance regulations are lined up with NIST. They use the NIST framework. So if you're, uh, you have HIPAA compliance or FINRA compliance, or really any, any compliance regulation, if you're aligned with NIST, then you'll be compliant with whatever industry regulation you would fall under. So the way they set it up is with different categories. Uh, there's an identify and then all the things you need to do around cybersecurity that will help you identify what the issues are, are and what you could do to uh, align with those issues. Then there's the protect category. And then here's where you start getting into the things you can proactively do to prevent yourself from falling prey to a cybersecurity attack. Also part of the uh, NIST framework, you have to be able to detect if something's either already on your system or trying to break into your system. So it gives you some ideas on what you need to do around the detect category. And then unfortunately, if uh, you do fall prey to a cybersecurity attack, whether it's a business email compromise like John uh, just demonstrated or a ransomware attack, what you need to do to be able to respond. And then again, it has the various uh, things you would do as an organization. And then lastly, one, once you've responded and started the remediation process, what you need to do to recover successfully. So, you know, that's pretty much the framework that we would recommend that a small or medium sized business use for two reasons. One, a lot of small businesses understand that cybersecurity is a problem. The issues that they're having is, where do I get started? Where do I begin? You know, and, and this identifies exactly where, where to start, what to do, and actually where to spend your money most wisely. So that, that's kind of the uh, framework that we would recommend uh, a small or medium sized business uses. If you go to the next slide, it'll actually show you specifically what VIA and Scout can do to help you address the, those uh, categories and, and how you would uh, you know, start to approach uh, a more secure uh, cybersecurity posture. So Ian, why don't you cover some of the things that uh, VIA does, and I'll, I'll then talk about uh, Barracuda Scout. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, the goal should be to have proper coverage in all areas recommended by the NIST framework. Um, as mentioned earlier, we want to address the other uh, people, processes, and technology. Uh, some of those items can be done in-house, while others are a lot more difficult to do in-house, and that's where we come in. So, uh, and also another thing to keep in mind here is this is not an exhaustive list of what solutions should be used to align with NIST. There are, are many products, many services um, that are going to go into that overall alignment. But I'm just going to cover the big ones here. Um, and then I'll also let Steve talk about the gray ones. Uh, the orange ones are specifically ones that we're going to be, be focusing on here. So uh, user and device management down at the bottom left addresses access management and access or asset management and access control. 
Uh, NIST wants you to know what's in your environment and have controls in place to lock down access appropriately. Um, so that's what user device management accomplishes. Um, risk management and risk management strategy um, are covered by vulnerability assessments and penetration assessments. These assessments take an active approach by going in depth to identify weaknesses in your security so you can patch them up before they're exploited by the attackers. Um, awareness uh, and, and training is covered by security awareness training. That's fairly self, uh, self explanatory. Um, information protection processes and procedures. This covers a wide range of documents that out outline um, how your business operates and ensures you're following security best practices. Um, it's another thing we can help with. Um, and lastly, the incident response tabletop. Um, the response and uh, the last two phases here are really about how you respond and recover to a security incidents. And a tabletop um, allows the business to go through kind of the procedures what, um, step by step to ensure that um, if the, an actual event does occur, we know what to do um, beforehand. Um, so kind of bring it back to the, uh, the three ways, um, which are people's process and technology. User and device management and vulnerability assessments targets the technology focus. Uh, security awareness training targets the people focus and policies and procedures um, and the tabletop targets the process focus. Um, and Steve, uh, you can talk about the great ones. Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, one of the things that we do under the protect category is we uh, do provide uh, protective uh, proactive technology and, and that's important because you have to know if you have a problem. Uh, knowing if you have a problem will allow uh, VIA to take response time down so that a, an issue uh, that could potentially spin out of control doesn't. Uh, we also do a lot of work around uh, detection. So again, a lot of organizations uh, already have someone on their system. If you look at either Gartner or the Verizon breach report, the average time a hacker spends on your system is about 206 days. So many organizations, even the large ones, have people on their system, hackers on their system before they even realize they have a problem. And that's where uh, the detect products come in. So we actually have uh, devices, we have solutions that can, uh, again, proactively detect anomalous behavior or actual cyber events. Uh, we'll monitor uh, a client's network uh, continuously, 24-7, 365, as I said earlier. So we never take uh, our eye off uh, a client's network. And obviously, uh, we need to put something in place that will be able to detect if there's some anomalous behavior. So, you know, again, it, it's, it's not only a technology solution uh, that we deploy, but it's the ability to act proactively and help your employees out if in the event there's a situation that uh, they can't address by themselves. Thank you. Uh, from that framework, what are some low hanging fruit action items that are easy to implement but add a lot of value? Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, great question. Um, so this is what I like to recommend to absolutely everyone. Um, based on what we know about where the threats are primarily coming from, uh, these four items are relatively simple to implement but add a tremendous amount of security. Uh, those are MFA, email security, endpoint security, and cybersecurity awareness training. Uh, the reason why I suggest each of those uh, for MFA uh, is because, as mentioned earlier, passwords alone no longer cut it. Studies show that MFA can prevent roughly 90% of account compromise type attacks. So that's a huge payoff for not a lot of work or money. Um, email security, uh, because like you mentioned earlier, phishing isn't going anywhere. It's here to stay. It's effective. Um, your email security solution should do more than just be a spam filter. It should uh, flag external emails, identify potentially dangerous ones, um, just kind of what like John was demonstrating earlier. Um, and then the endpoint security, um, because malware is also here to stay, ideally your endpoint security solution should do more than just a traditional virus detection. It should be able to detect abnormal behavior as well. Um, and then lastly, cybersecurity awareness training. Uh, since users are always going to be the weakest links, unfortunately, it's critical that you build up th those front lines by raising awareness and training your employees on how to catch those incidents before they happen. Awesome, Ian. And I know you kind of went through those bullet points uh, pretty fast. We will have a slide uh, with those listed on there, but we always love actionable items of, here's the whole framework, it looks big, uh, you know, and we can help with that step by step, but you know, yeah, those you get your bang for your buck, those four that you mentioned, so thank you. 
Uh, we noticed you showed the hacker signing in uh, to the email, John. Uh, is there a way to show where these logs are coming from? There you go. Uh, yep, absolutely. So, um, like, uh, for example, so Ian mentioned uh, flagging emails, right? So that's pretty important. So there, there is technology that can be put in place uh, to sort of detect these things, right? Both from a log perspective and a proactive perspective. So. Uh, for example, I actually have uh, another quick uh, demo here where we're taking the same exact uh, situation, right? Someone is trying to send you that uh, email that looks like it's coming from Microsoft. Um, and if I go ahead and uh, share my screen here, uh, we could actually take a look at what it looks like when you actually have something in place to protect you against this sort of attack. So if I head over, you can see I have that same exact email that we had before. It was the Microsoft account team. They said that there was something wrong with my account and I need to sign in. But this time you could see there's a red banner to warn the recipient of that email, right? So this, this is really the, the game changer. This is what we talk about when we talk about training the end users, right? Not only during that formal training that happens maybe once a year, but how about continuously? How about every day when they're looking at their emails and they get a brand impersonation email, for example? Um, and then on top of that, you have things like uh, link rewriting, right? So this sort of this solution, when you click on that link, uh, if an end user does, uh, because sometimes that's what end users do, it sends you to this um, sandboxed environment uh, where it doesn't allow you to proceed. It does provide you a screenshot, and you can see that's uh, again the same exact sign-in page uh, that we entered in our credentials before, uh, but this time it's warning us, right? We've clicked a link. And it's taking us to this nonsense domain, and uh, it's a it's impersonating Microsoft. So um, there is that. And then you also asked about uh, sort of seeing those logs, right? And partnership between Barracuda uh, and Vea. It's uh, you know it is possible. So I'll bring up uh, another view here, and uh, we can take a look at those logs. So. Just bring you up here and I'll share my screen again. Great. So I'm in our cybersecurity dashboard. So what did it first start with? It started with that uh, phishing email, right? So let's get that visibility. So the end users saw that banner and we can also pull up those banners on our end, right? We could add filters, change that threat level to danger. So I'm just filtering to those red bannered emails. Uh, and if I scroll down here, we could even filter down further by looking at just brand impersonation emails, right? Now it's going to tell me who in the organization uh, has received these emails, and I can even see them specifically down here for my analysis results. So if I go ahead and click on that, I could see it was a brand impersonation. In this case, this one was appearing to be Home Depot, but it wasn't sent from one of Home Depot's domains, very similar to the uh, Microsoft one. It said it's from Microsoft, but it's not from one of their domains. Um, and as well as some other content like first time sender, spam content. It's really an all encompassing solution. Um, next step was uh, signing into that account, right? Well, there's a place to look for logs for account logins. So here's Office 365 logins. So we could see on a geographic map where users are logging in from, and we can even make rules. So if someone's logging in from an unusual location, we can have an alert for that. We could see the failed logins, the IP address, in, uh, internet service provider, and all of the failed login events, as well as the successful ones if you needed to. Um, and then the final step was setting up that email forwarding rule, and that's what's so critical, right? You need something in place to continuously monitor and alert you for uh, these sort of um, events that are taking place. So I go over here and search for, uh, forwarding and there we go so i'll go ahead and filter that a little bit further and we could see there's our office 365 email forwarding rule that was created it tells us the exact account it happened on and now we can go to that account reset the password check to make sure is this a legitimate uh, email forwarding rule that was set up or was it someone that fished credentials and uh, and uh, was able to take advantage of that wow Thank you. Thanks for showing us all that great intel. Uh, be sure to uh, put in the chat if you have any questions thus far. Um, 
thank you so much for um, our presenters today for walking us through how cybersecurity attacks typically start uh, with people. Uh, Ian and Steve, you told us stories about phishing attacks that started with the employees and how important training is, um, and then what processes can be put into place to avoid these attacks, and then the type of technologies uh, to implement and, and mitigate these risks. Do you have any other uh, final thoughts about um, these three focus areas that you'd like to share? Yeah, so uh, I, would, I would say a couple of things on that. Uh, one is uh, a lot of small businesses um, fall under various compliance regulations, and, and because it's such an overwhelming task for them to deal with, they unfortunately sometimes um, ignore the regulation and don't comply or have a hard time complying. But you know, if you use the NIST framework, as I said earlier, it automatically puts you in compliance with 90% of the regulations that are out there. So you know, being that uh, a lot of your clients are, are based in uh, Arizona, uh, a lot of them may not realize that if they have customers in California and do business in California, then all of a sudden CCPA becomes an issue for them in terms of compliance. Or if they're a small healthcare provider, they may not realize that regardless of their size, you know, HIPAA is an issue that they have to deal with. So the list goes on and on in terms of, uh, you know, how we can help them. And again, it's all boils down to aligning with NIST and, and letting VIA uh, work with you on, on getting set up there. Awesome, thanks for going over that middle checklist there, applying this to your framework. Um, beginning with low hanging fruit, uh, that is what Ian uh, was sharing with us. These are uh, very valuable uh, things that you can just start uh, checking off your list to start implementing a framework. Um, and then identifying uh, relevant advanced defenses uh, from there. Uh, presenters, any other uh, thoughts on, on these three columns? Awesome. Thank you. Well, by attending uh, this webinar, VIA would like to offer you a free cybersecurity uh, webinar. So thank you so much for joining us today um, and helping you put together your framework. So while I'm opening up the floor for questions, uh, feel free to chat those in. I will be posting a link in the chat so that you can schedule your 60 minute consultation meeting um, or feel free to take a screenshot of the previous page on, on those three ways or uh, four low hanging fruits that we can get you started with. Um, on the page right now, you can email uh, techhelpatthevia.com uh, to schedule that. Uh, you can visit our website uh, or you can give us a call, but the easiest way is to click on the link in uh, the chat. It should be posted there now. It will bring up a, a website called Appointment Core, and you can find a, a 60 minute slot uh, to book your uh, cybersecurity assessment with. So let me go ahead and check out some of these questions here in the chat and feel free to keep uh, chiming in. We do have a couple here. Um, I will kick off with, uh, what do you do if you accidentally click a link in an email or think someone has been hacked in your company? Yeah, I could go ahead and take that one. Um, yeah, uh, quite a few. Um, I'd say resetting the user's password, probably the very first thing you should do. Um, and then after that, uh, setting up multi-factor authentication, right? We talked about that a little bit today, how that significantly cuts down on um, future account compromises. So resetting users' passwords, enabling multi-factor, um, removing those uh, or checking to see if there's any forwarding addresses, right? Like how we just demonstrated today and removing those, um, disabling any suspicious inbox rules. Um, and then I guess an, an extra precautionary would be check the sent, sent uh, box for that account, because if it was compromised, typically an attacker will go through, go to the contacts page of that account or go to the sent uh, portion of that and then start sending out the same type of uh, phishing attack to other users, because now it's coming from a trusted account. It's not coming from a random account, right? Right. Thank you, and thanks for that question, Jeff. Um, and feel free to raise your hand. I can unmute you or uh, take you off camera if you'd like uh, to ask these questions live. Um, our next question is, 
uh, what is spear phishing and how is it different than phishing? I could take that one too. Okay. Um, yeah, awesome. So, uh, fear, uh, phishing in general are emails that are sent to a very large number of recipients, uh, usually at random. So, you know, you might be familiar with these. You'll get an email and it, it'll say, well, it'll pretend to be from, let's say, Netflix, for example, and it'll say, dear customer, right? Again, these are uh, indiscriminate. They've been sent out at large. They're really just trying to try their luck at large numbers, right? Send this out to a million people and hopefully we'll get a bite, um, pun intended on the, the phishing there. Um, and then with spear phishing, it's a much more targeted attack. So they might look into you a little bit more. They might actually find out your name. And now instead of it just dear customer, it'll actually be dear Sam, for example. And they'll maybe put some uh, details in there. And that makes it uh, a little bit more believable um, when they're targeting you and they have those specific details, a uh, higher chance of or higher click rates is what they're hoping for with that one. Got it. They did their homework. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I have another question here. Um, what things can I do to personally protect myself and my family from cyber threats? No, I'll go ahead and take that one. Um, so what I do personally and recommend that everyone does um, is uh, use multi-factor authentication that we talked about uh, all throughout this, um, wherever possible, whatever accounts allow you to do that. Um, use a password manager. Uh, I used to, to kind of have like a few, maybe four or five passwords on rotation, use the same ones over and over again, and that was uh, definitely a big problem. So I definitely use a password manager. It allows you to uh, generate uh, random ones, um, kind of uh, it adds a, a lot of security to the passwords that you use instead of using the same ones you use. Um, and then use a VPN over public Wi-Fi because that is a def people will listen in on, if you, especially if you're doing transactions, logging to a bank, um, sending money. So definitely does. Yes, I love the password management tool. It's great. Um, and I, this the last question that I have. Uh, what industries do hackers target the most? So I'll, uh, I'll take that one. It used to be financial and healthcare were the biggies, but not anymore. Hackers are very indiscriminate. Uh, they go after all industries of any size. So, you know, they, they realize pretty quickly that, you know, financial organizations have become a tough organization to break into. Healthcare has also improved their cybersecurity posture. So who, who can we go after now that has a, a low uh, cyber uh, security threshold? Small and medium sized businesses. And that's why you see that uh, paradigm shift I spoke about earlier, where 60% uh, of the attacks go after small businesses of any type. It could be anything from manufacturing to you know, construction companies, you know, typically organizations you wouldn't think of as being a target for a hacker, not true anymore. So there's really no one industry they seem to favor. Thank you, Steve. Well, I, that's all of the questions I had in the chat box. Thank you all so much for participating and thanks again to our presenters today. Uh, we did wrap up a little bit early, so uh, I'll remain on the line for the next couple minutes or so to see if there's any pending questions. Uh, but thanks again for joining. And again, this is a, a recorded webinar, so uh, it will be posted. Take care. Thanks. For, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.